number 17, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In other words, it wasn't necessarily convenient. It wasn't easy. In fact, it took an act of God for God to take on flesh. Okay, it didn't necessarily provide him any personal gain, but it behooved him. In other words, it helped or it facilitated, it expedited the process of fallen man being saved. It wasn't necessarily because it was what God deserved, but it's what we needed. It behooved him to become like his brethren. What's that mean? To put on flesh, to become like us so we could become like him. Then chapter number 18 says, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Or as the Bible says elsewhere, he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin. And in reference between verse number 17 and verse number 18, Okay, it calls him that he might be able to be a faithful and merciful high priest in chapter number seven, or verse number 17 of chapter 2. Then in verse number 1, we see that we should consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. What those verses go on to say, the high priest in the Old Testament, keep in mind, this is the epistle written to the Hebrews, people that knew the Old Testament the best. Okay, in the Old Testament, the high priest was the one that was responsible for making the sacrifices for sins that, if done according to as God laid out, would push the sins back of God's people for one year. Well, how can a high priest be merciful? How can a high priest be faithful unless he understands the sacrifice for which he has been entrusted to make? It would have been one thing for God to say, I'll pay for all your sins. But Christ said, I'll pay for all your sins after I have experienced and overcome all of the things that cause you to sin. He didn't just say, we'll wipe it off the board. No, he became like us, was better than us because he's the perfect only begotten son of God. And because he overcame what we could not, then he made the sin sacrifice, his own precious blood, which he gave freely, willingly. And now when we, even after we get saved, whether it's the prayer of, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner, and then we receive salvation, or whether it's, you know, First John, that we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Our high priest understands why we fell, because he overcame it. Not only does he know what it takes to make it right, he's already done what it took to make it right. See, you could be a faithful high priest without being a merciful high priest. You could be a merciful high priest without being a faithful high priest. But Christ, because he took on the form of man to fulfill the law or the requirement of God, now he can be both faithful and merciful towards those that come to him. Because it's the high priest's responsibility. All of it rests on his shoulder. He was responsible for all the priests underneath of him. In fact, that was the indictment back in Samuel's day of that high priest. That his sons, who were supposedly ministers of God, were offering up strange sacrifices before the Ark of the Covenant. They were doing deceitfully and wickedly in the eyes of God, and it should have fallen on the shoulders of the high priest, but he ignored it. But see, Christ, our high priest, Nobody higher than him. Right? The highest of the high priests. Understanding the burden and the accountability. Us. Revelation chapter 1, being made kings and priests. We were made priests so that we could go directly before the throne of God. But when we get there, we find a merciful and a faithful high priest. Willing to accept our prayers and offer the sacrifices needed so that there's nothing that stands between us and God not really anything what we're going to be teaching about today but that's what's going on in these verses that's what he's talking about but see verse number one he says because Christ did all of those things is what wherefore means he says holy brethren doesn't call his brethren 
Because he took on the form of a servant to fulfill the will of the Father, that there might be a way for man to become the sons of God. We're not just brethren. We're holy brethren. If you got in under the same blood that I got in under, it doesn't matter where you got in under it, doesn't matter how you got in under it, doesn't matter who's preaching, doesn't matter what prayer you said. I can tell you what prayer I said. It was real simple. Lord, please save me. And I just kept saying that over and over again until the guy next to me, who happened to be the preacher, got done praying. Right? I want to make sure I got it right. But it doesn't matter what you said, where you were when you said it. All that matters is, is that you did what Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9 said, that with the heart, man believeth unto right, with the mouth, confession is made. Right? If you realize that you was a sinner and you needed Christ, and you, with your mouth and with your heart, believe that that's all that it took, He'd save you. It's that simple. But see, in the Old Testament, they were just brethren. Didn't matter how many sacrifices they offered up. Didn't matter how much they lived to please God. There was always something that kept them from being what God envisioned or intended for them. Which was what? To be made in the image of God. But to be the children of God. To be as God. Now you can believe what you want to. I believe when God made Adam that he made Adam just like himself. You know what made the difference between Adam and Jesus, our second Adam? Adam fell to sin. If it wouldn't have been for sin, everyone that would have come after Adam and Eve, had it been the will of God for them to have children in the Garden of Eden, they'd have been just like Adam and Eve, which were just made in the image of God. God always intended us to have fellowship with him. If they weren't, if God didn't make them perfect, why would God walk with them in the cool of the day? God doesn't you know, tolerate sin or iniquity. They wouldn't have had fellowship. But see, because of what our high priest did and does today, now we're holy brethren. I'm no longer a child of the fosters. No, I'm a child of the king. We got a title. Not because of what I did, but because it was bestowed upon me. Holy brother. Partakers of our heavenly calling. Well, you know what a partaker means? It means you're part of it. You can't partake of something that you're not a part of. Right? If you were to have a family reunion, if somebody that wasn't family showed up and tried to take food, who are you? Why are you here? You related to any of us? I know we got a big family, but if you're not of us, get out. This is a family deal. But I imagine most of us would be more forgiving than that. But you get the point. That family reunions for family. Birthday parties are for people that know the person that had the birthday. You don't just get to show up and be a partaker of things that you're not a part of. But why can we be partakers of a heavenly calling? Because we now have a heavenly or a holy title. Then it goes on and say, consider. That word consider, short word, but it's got a whole lot behind it. Consider means to reflect upon. Not to remember. Consider means to analyze. Sit down and think about it for a while. Chew it over a little bit. Consider means to implement that which has been laid out in front of you. If it was a consider the example of, and then we could go on, what's that mean? Learn that lesson, but then apply it to your life is what consider means. Consider means look at what's in front of you and take what you need from it. Because it doesn't say think about doesn't say remember. It says consider, which is to implement. If you think about something, you think about it, and then it's gone. If you consider something, you recall something, you digest it, and then you take what you need from it and implement it into you. Consider is a call to action, but then it's also a call to change. If we didn't need anything, it wouldn't have said consider. 
But thankfully, I got a holy calling. I can be a partaker of heavenly things. But in order to do so, I must consider, because as I am now, I'm seated in heavenly places. My conversation's recorded there, but I, I still got to catch up with it. I'm still here. There are things that I need to consider about Christ to make sure that here I still can be a partaker of heavenly things. Because down here there's a whole lot of things that aren't heavenly. There are a whole lot of things about Jordan that didn't get saved when he got saved. And this flesh tries to rob you of heavenly callings, of heavenly being a partaker of the things that Christ... I mean, we just sang about it. Simply taking from Christ. Life and rest, joy, peace. All the blessings that are intended for the children of God, the world would want to rob you of those things. So consider our high priest so that we can learn from him what is necessary to continue to be partakers of those heavenly things. I don't get those things because now I'm holy. Oh, no. I don't have any righteousness. That's why I'm borrowing his until I get a body like his. He robed me in his. Because mine's not enough. But I can, considering, I can, in that robe of his righteousness, position myself that God will be pleased with me. He's not pleased with me because of where I'm at, but he's pleased with me on what I will be in Christ one day. And through obedience, because consider our high priest, Everything he did was the will of the Father. Every step, every breath, every person that he talked to was because that was the will of God. Consider our high priest. Are we that way? Or do the cares of the world cause us to step outside of that robe of righteousness and instead of being partakers of heavenly things, now we're partakers of the world. Consider those things. Learn from our apostle, our high priest, our Savior, Christ Jesus. And then apply it. It's one of the greatest you know, passages of the Bible that over in Antioch in the book of Acts that they didn't call themselves these believers in Christ. Now Saul was down there after he got saved. He hadn't been Paul yet, but he saw we know that Barnabas went down to Antioch to, after he'd heard that Saul got saved he said we're going to go make sure he's the real deal and then once they realized he was the real deal they just had themselves time in Christ and all them believers down in Antioch they grew in faith and in spirituality why? because they were partakers of heavenly things now and they didn't call themselves people in Antioch called them Christians because they were Christ like the thing that boggles my mind is they never called the disciples Christian. The other 11 apostles in Jerusalem. All the believers in Jerusalem at that church, which depending on which historical account, tens of thousands of people in that church. That's why they had to meet in the homes. They didn't have a church big enough for everybody to meet in the same place. Daily they met just to try to get everybody the, the message that God wanted them to hear that week. They met in people's houses breaking bread. But never were those in Jerusalem called Christian. Is those that weren't Hebrew, those that didn't have a claim to God, those that people didn't believe could get saved. They heard that Saul had gotten saved. They said, there's no way that's a trick. That guy has been trying to kill us. He didn't get in. But yet that group was called Christians first. Why? Because if you ask me, they just considered their high priest and said, doesn't matter what we used to be. What matters is who He made us. Then, verse number 1 continues to go on. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Anybody know what a profession is? The reason I ask that, because the first definition that comes to our mind is not the original use of the word. Go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. You don't believe me. Nowadays, people will tell you that a profession is your job. It's not what a profession is. It's one of the things that a profession can be. But the true definition of a profession is an outward declaration. Now, because of what you do for a living, some people may say that your part of your profession is that you claim to be a doctor or that you claim to be a welder, Brother Phil. 
Right? That's part of your outward declaration. This is what I do as part of my life. That's why they nowadays say, well, what's your profession going to be? Because once you decide what you're going to do, you're going to tell everybody about it. It's an outward declaration, something that you want to make known publicly. See, a profession, by definition, is what happens inside, whether in your head, in your heart, in your soul. It's what you make known outwardly about what has happened inside. Once someone has decided what they're going to do for a living, they make it their profession by saying, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Yet what he says, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Because see, when you believed on him, outwardly, your profession was that, I got saved. You didn't get saved because of your profession, but because you got saved, you made a profession. And see, I got a real, got a real problem with people say that they're saved, and I got a problem telling other people about it. Because if he changed you on the inside, you're going to have a profession outside. It's just going to come out. Right? I mean, you can try and hide a candle underneath of a bushel, but if God wants that light to shine, you're going to catch a whole bushel on fire. There's a whole lot of the flesh that will try to darken it out, but there's something about God that the flesh can't stop. Especially if we consider our high priest, them things that are in the way are going to get out of the way real quick. Them things that we used to want to do, now we don't want to do them no more. That's all part of your profession. Okay, a lot of times, we will replace the word profession with testimony. Right? Whether it's verbal or whether it's a visual ob observation of your life, your profession or your testimony is what others see when they look at you. And see, sometimes the profession and the testimony don't match up. What they say doesn't match with what they live. Why do you think that the epistles tell us that we're an epistle known and read of all men? Because your life, the way that you live, if it doesn't match up with your profession, you're a contradiction in the faith. And contradictions to Christ do damage to the cause of Christ. Because, see, there were a group of people down in Antioch. Because of what they said happened on the inside and because of the way that they lived, because of the change that was made in them, people said they're real. They called others Christ-like because they saw Christ, they'd heard about Christ, they'd heard the ministry of Christ, whether they had seen Him in the flesh or not, they knew about Christ. And they said their life looks like what we heard about Christ. That's a marvelous thing. The tragic thing is that that doesn't happen nowadays. The tragic thing is that somebody can call themselves a Christian, believe something that wasn't of Christ, and people still believe that they're Christians. Um, we don't have time to get into all that. But, if I get irritated with it, imagine how much God gets irritated with it. That they've blasphemed the very name of His Son by claiming to be something that He never stood for. And then that others be deceived into a lie and buy into it and think that, well, that must be Christ-like. But see, the reason we went through all that, verse number 1, says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling one of the things that you got in on when you got saved is that you became a part of the calling there's a general call to salvation there are specific calls like God may call a man to preach God may call a man to pastor God may call a man to be a missionary God may call someone to be a prayer warrior God may call some to just be like Barnabas, where they go and they encourage those that are down in the faith. There are many calls that God can put upon your life. But there is the heavenly calling that goes out to everyone that gets saved. There are a lot of things that go, part of that, part of that is a great commission. 
Part of that is the instruction of the New Testament on how Christ says we ought to live. We are all called to be ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of our new heavenly home. We are all called to be witnesses of Christ. We're called to be learned about God, the things of God, to be mature, to grow into the faith. We're all called to be salt of the earth. We're all called to be light of the world. We're all called to be servants. We're all called to be followers of Christ. We're called to be companions of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that two weeks ago. We're called to be many things, but it's a heavenly calling. See, I've been doing a little bit of reading on some things. A little bit of study. There's a whole lot of mess out there. Things that, from the outside in, I look at them and I say, how in the world can people get caught up with that? Nothing necessarily wicked about it, but it's nonsense. I'll give you one example. Pyramid schemes. Nowadays they call it, well, you used to call them multi-level marketing. Now they're calling them direct sales companies. What's that? you got to pay to be a part of it, and you can't really make money by selling what they're selling, so you've got to recruit other people into it so that you get part of the money that they pay in to become a part of it. Money travels up, not down. A whole bunch of them out there. A whole bunch of other things. Self-help groups. Right? Things that will turn you into a better salesman. Things that will turn you into... You know, better husband, better wife, better whatever you want to. But instead of putting it in a book and saying, well, here, if you buy the book, or better yet, if really you think it's going to help people, you give it away for free. But hey, here's a book, buy it. No. They say, if you want to learn about the things that I can teach you, you've got to pay so much money a month, and you can become part of a class, and then if you don't succeed, it's your fault. Because look at all these other people that are saying it's helping them. A lot of it boils down to humanism. The Bible does say that as man thinks, so is he. But there's a problem with that. Man's not all powerful. You can think that you're something, but if a man think of he's staying, let him take heed lest he fall. But if you think something's going to help you, you'd spend every dime trying to chase it. Why? Because in your head, that's what you need. See, we're saints. Holy brother. Why in the world do I think that the world has anything to offer me that I would need? So many Christians chasing something. This thing gets on my nerves. I, I don't say it anymore, Brother Bob. Unless somebody asks me about it. But there's this thing where people... The official term is manifesting. Other people use visualization. But if you want a fancy car, you print out the picture of the fancy car and you hang it up so you see it every day, you're reminded of it. That's what I'm working for. That's an idol. That's all it is. Well, but if all I want is that, if overtime opens up, well, of course I'll take it because I want that. Well, what if overtime cuts in the middle of church? Doesn't matter. I want that. What if getting that means that I've got to give up this, 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 and this. Doesn't matter. I want that. I want a nicer house. Well, God in this with contentment, great gain. Content doesn't mean that it's all that you want. Content means God gave it to me, that's enough. If I need more, God will give me something more. But me obsessing about what I need going to, my Heavenly Father's promised to take care of all of my needs. Why am I concerned about my needs? He said He's got it. I just believe that when He said He's got it, He's got it. He's God. He can take care of it. He said, well, Brother Jordan. But Jordan got hit head on in a car crash. Car got totaled. From the time wreck happened, I can't even remember when it happened now. But from the time it happened, the car never rolled again. The engine ran, but it didn't move because of all the damage. It got put up on a tow truck, and they took it. I never saw it again. Okay, total. Well, it just so happened 
Yeah, Miss Taya, my sister-in-law, was in Chicago for training on her new job. Guess what that meant? Brother had an extra car for me to drive around for a little bit. And guess how long Taya was out of town training? Just long enough for Jordan to get a new car. Now, did it matter that my brother, when he let me borrow his car, didn't have any gas in the car? No, because I should have expected that. But I didn't need gas. I needed a car. I could put gas in the car. I needed a car. Then you say, what are you talking about? I don't worry about things like that. I wasn't worried that I was going to get in a wreck and not have a car. Why? Because if God wanted it to happen, it's going to happen. And God already knew to the end before I knew that it had started. I've got more important things to be worried about. What's that? Heavenly things. He called us holy brethren. He said, we can be partakers of our heavenly calling. Why would I ever desire anything in the world when I can have things that are so much greater? Not a calling. No, no, no. A heavenly calling. We were invited to be partakers of something because Christ made us what we could not be on our own, which was holy brethren. We now can become partakers of and we are instructed to become partakers of Right? It shouldn't, he shouldn't have had to have instructed us to become. The fact that now we can have the, all the things that the Spirit, the new man inside of us, wants to have, that should be enough. But then he also instructed us to become partakers of a heavenly calling. I mean, you can have whatever job title in the world you want. I'm not impressed. Why? Because I know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He gave me a call. You can chase a promotion all you want. If God gives it to you, God bless. I'm happy for you. Don't get me wrong. God wants to bless you with a better job, with a new job, with a better position within the job. I'm happy for you because God knew you needed it and God provided it. I'm happy for you. God give you the desires of your heart. I'm rejoicing with you because the same God that gave you that gave me the desires of my heart. Don't get me wrong on any of that. But why is our focus on these things when we are partakers of a heavenly calling? Why does it matter what happens on the job when I have a heavenly calling that's so much more important? Why does it matter on whether or not this happened or that happened or... Well, my kid didn't get student of the month this month. Well, maybe your kid wasn't the best student in the whole month. Why does any of that matter? If your kid's saved, they got something more important to worry about. If they're not saved, you've got something more important to worry about. That's them getting saved. Well, this happened or that happened. Set your eyes on heavenly things. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What are these heavenly things that we're called to? Conversation with a thrice holy God and He wants to hear from me and wants to talk back to me. Why do you care what somebody thinks about you? Why do you care about impressing other people? Why do you want to get in good graces with somebody when you can be in good graces with the very one that authored all of creation? He already knows all about me, but he wants to know how my day went, even though he knows how my day went, because he wants me to have enough trust in him to cast all my cares upon him so that he, being a holy God that's all-powerful, can take care of those things which are too great for me. Why would I ever want to call up a psychiatrist when I can talk to Jesus? Why would I ever want to talk to a doctor before I talk to Jesus? Not saying I wouldn't talk to the doctor. I had back surgery in February. You know why I had back surgery? Because God gave me peace about having back surgery. You know who I talked to before I ever talked to a doctor? God. Before I would ever talk to a recruiter, before I would ever talk to somebody about a new job interview, you know who I'm talking to first? God. 
And I've said this many times, there should be no shock to anybody. But before I ever would even consider, it would take an act of God for me to consider leaving the Emmanuel Baptist Church. But if God told me He wanted me somewhere else, you couldn't keep me from being there. Because my heavenly calling says that I need to be where He wants me to be. I would be doing a disservice to everything God wanted going on here if I knew I should be somewhere else and I stayed here. I'd be miserable, in my opinion, being at the best church in all of the churches. Not because the church was any less great, but because I wasn't where God wanted me to be. And if I got up and I taught every week in a place that God didn't want me to be and I knew that I didn't need to be there, I guarantee you Jordan wouldn't be teaching Sunday school for much longer. Why? Because the under-shepherd would do what the shepherd told him, which is get rid of the guy that's not supposed to be here. Doesn't matter if it is his son. If you don't believe me on that, I hopefully it doesn't take an act of God to show you that. What are you saying? There's so many things that we get caught up with that wouldn't even darken our day, wouldn't even phase us if we had the perspective that we were supposed to have. Do you understand that you are entrusting? And that word entrust means that God knew you were capable of doing it, so He asked you to do it. You cannot entrust something to someone if they're incapable of doing the job. Then that's called squandering. You didn't entrust it to somebody. You just threw it away because you knew that person wasn't able to do whatever they said they were supposed to be able to do. But no, He entrusted you with Himself through the person of the Holy Spirit to take the story of His only begotten Son to those that needed it just as much as you needed it. But how much do you need life dearly? You need it direly. And yet you were the one that he entrusted to do it. You say, well, I don't believe that. How, why would he entrust me? That's, that's a job for a preacher. No, it's a job for everybody. Part of heaven and calling. Do you understand that the holy God of heaven, after you got saved, looked at you, saw all that he was going to do in your life, and said, they can be a more effective witness than anybody else for these people they're people that only you can win I can't win them if I tried to I'd be doing you know I'd be acting against the will of God I'd be doing hurt trying to win people I can only win the people that God entrusts me to win but see it's God's will that none should perish you know what that means God made a way for all of them which means God intended for somebody to go to them and if I'm the one that God intended to go win those people, if I don't actively embrace my heavenly calling, those people are going to die and go to hell, and it's not God's fault, it's mine. When I think about that, who cares what sport team won? When I care about that, who cares how bad of a day I had on the job? I've got people that I've been entrusted with to go and win. I've been entrusted by God with the purpose that Christ initially had, which was to win the lost. I can't win them, but I can take them what they need for Christ to win them. I can't help them, but I know the one that does, that can, that will, so long as somebody goes and tells. Who's that? That's me. And yes, some people aren't going to believe you until they see the pattern of works in your life, your testimony that prove that you believe what your profession is. You can't just go knock on somebody's door and then they're going to fall down, although sometimes it happens that that person, knowing that they're not right with God because maybe they grew up in a right church, they've been praying all week, Lord, I don't know what I need, but I pray that you send it, and then somebody show up at the door. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I've heard where it does happen. But I've also heard where somebody for years wants to fight everything that somebody's telling them, but they can't get away from it because the person just keeps living it in front of them. I don't know how God wants to, but I know that God does want to. 
It's not up to me on how God does it. I just know what I can do, and it's my responsibility to do it. We're running out of time. But part of that heavenly calling is worship. Really. Because I know who we're talking to here. I know what services y'all been in because I've been in them with, with you. In the services that we've had around here. Not just recently. I, I got a long memory. All the things that we've seen God do around here, why wouldn't we want to come in, set aside how bad I feel, how bad a night's rest I got, right? How bad my work week was. No, no, no. None of that matters right now. Because today is the Lord's day. Not just because it's the day that He made, but it's because of the day we've set aside that we give to Him today. Unreserved, no limits, it's His day. Whatever He wants is what He gets. Now that should be every day in your life, but we don't have time to get back on that. That today is the day that is part of my heavenly call. I get to give back. Unreserved my best unto God expecting nothing just because He deserves it. Too many people are caught up on what happens after God's people start praising Him which is He inhabits the praise of His people. We're not called to have great service. We're called to praise. The very act of worshiping and praising God should be so enjoyable to us that it doesn't matter if He shows up or not. It's the best thing that's going to happen to me all day to just get up and say how great that the Lord has been. That today we get to come and hear from the very Word of God what God wanted you to hear for today. You do realize that even if you're under conviction you can praise God. It's called getting right. Whatever He wants you to do you get, then you can start getting in on the praise. But it brings great praise under the name of Christ when we say God's right and I'm wrong and we get it made right. The fact that we are called to be worshipers of Christ. Yet we take so little thought of it. We work on improving this aspect of ourselves or if I could just be a better communicator. I talk all the time, trust me. You don't wish you were a better communicator because it means that they're going to make you talk to people more often and you want to do that. One of the guys that normally answers the phone that work was on vacation this week and I volunteered to fill in for him. I talked on the phone for six hours on Friday. I don't like doing that. I mean, you can check. I'll, I'll bring you my phone bill. Guess how many minutes a month I talk on my phone? I guarantee you it's under 20 in a month what are you saying I was talked out by the end of it everybody starts sounding the same did I talk to you earlier today nope never mind what are you saying there are things that you can try and improve but why don't we try and improve the things that we're called to When's the last time we said, Lord, make me a better worshiper? Make me a better prayer? Lord, how do I be a better witness for you? Lord, teach me how to have fellowship with you better. Lord, teach me how I can keep my mind on the things of God more than the things of the world. Lord, teach me how to embrace the heavenly calling that you put on my life. Because, Lord, I understand now I'm part of that holy brother. Lord, now I understand that I've been called, not because there's anything special about me, but because I answered the call, he turned me into something special. He'd do for everybody what he did for me if people just let him. He wants to save everybody. He wants all of us to be great witnesses. He wants us all to be in great communication and fellowship with Him. Why? Because He instructed us to be. And if He instructed us to do it, He called us to it. And if He's able to do it, 
That means the only thing keeping us from becoming it is us. God wants everybody to be great prayer warriors. What stops it? Us. Because really, when we break it down, us praying, really? Nobody's a great prayer warrior. Because really, the Holy Spirit takes our prayer, puts it before the throne of God, then our high priest, Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, makes intercession for us. What's that mean? He takes, as our high priest, the offering that we brought, the prayer that we brought, and then He prepares it to present it unto God. What's that mean? He takes it and He makes it what God wants it to be, and then He offers it unto God. Because you just didn't bring a goat and throw a goat on the altar. No, there was preparation. There was much that God expected in order for God to accept it. So really, us being great prayers, communicators with God, is just learning to trim all the things that God doesn't want on there. And then offering it unto God in a way that He's acceptable. Because Christ is going to do it anyway. Holy Ghost is going to take those groanings and utterly that we can't even pray... Imagine how much praying you really do when you take into consideration all the times that the Holy Ghost takes those things you don't know how to pray for, those things that you can't even begin to understand that you need in your life, but yet because He's a faithful friend, He does take those unto God, and God the Son prays to God the Father for you to have that. A whole lot more praying goes on in your life than you realize. But imagine if you were just sensitive enough to say, Lord, I know that you're going to take care of all my needs. I pray that, you know, you'd, in my heart, remove the wants and desires that I don't need, replace them with yourself. But Lord, I just want to pray what you want me to pray. And then waiting until God tells you what He wants you to pray, and then praying it. Because really, prayer, all that it is, is getting our spirit in tune with the Spirit of God. Imagine if you said, Lord, I'm going to wait. Doesn't matter if it's an hour. Lord, doesn't matter if I have to get up and go to work, come back and get back on my face before you and wait another four or five hours. Doesn't matter if I need to stay up all night. Lord, I'm going to wait until you tell me what I need to pray and then I'm going to pray it. Imagine what our prayer life would be then. But so many people don't want to do that because they've forsaken the heavenly calling for whatever calling they've put on their life. They think that, well, that's what I need. No, what you need is more Him. Well, Brother Jordan, I'm saved. Hallelujah. Brother Jordan, I go out on visitation. Glory to the name of Jesus. I do this and I do that and I do this. Okay, but what else does God want you to do? Because if you're perfect, He'd take you to heaven. If you're doing enough for God's will to be fulfilled, Christ wouldn't have had to come. I'll be impressed when you do so much that God says, you know what, you no longer need the Holy Ghost in your life. That's when I'll be impressed. Because I know what the Bible says about all that the Holy Ghost does for us, and there's no way you're ever going to do that. But in all sincerity, it doesn't matter how much you do. You've always got a desire, if you're right with God, you always got a desire that, Lord, what else? What's missing? What else can I do what's keeping me from getting to the next level getting to the next step I guarantee you it's not in the world the thing that you need is here here and I can't point because I don't know where he's at but the Holy Ghost that indwells me that's where the rubber meets the road that's where you embrace your heavenly call we're partakers of it He's given you a spot at the table. He's got the silverware already set for you. Your name's on the chair. Nobody else can sit there but you. But how often do we actually sit down and become partakers? He's given you a portion, which is the same portion that He gave to everybody else, Himself. But yet, how often do we actually sit down and say, Lord, make what you've set in front of me, yours, make this a part of me. Truly become partakers with Christ, of Christ, for Christ. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. 
if you haven't already subscribed today. And as always, thanks for listening.